Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Neurological Associations of COVID-19 webinars, the COVID Neuro webinars. Uh, most of you are familiar with these. We've done about 10 now, I think. Uh, this is your monthly chance to catch up with everything neuro relating to COVID. I'm Tom Solomon. I'm based here at the University of Liverpool. My Twitter thing is there at Running Mad Prof. Um, these webinars are run through the Brain Infections Global portfolio, which is hosted by the Global Health Network. And we provide support for all sorts of issues relating to neurological infections. And in particular, recently, we've been focusing on COVID neuro. In terms of the latest, uh, this is off uh, the Economist website just an hour or so ago. As you know, there's a lot of interest in vaccine adverse events related to COVID-19, particularly neurological adverse events. So wherever you are in the world, if you're wanting to start looking at these, then through the Brain Infections Global webpage, which you can see here, we have a tab called COVID Vaccine Neuro Adverse Events. And here you can download our standardized case record forms for capturing information on patients who may have Bell's palsy or Guillain-Barre syndrome or strokes or anything else neurological that could possibly be an adverse event related to their COVID vaccination. So have a look at that webpage and download the information there. If you want to, it's all freely available. So the COVID neuro webinars are a chance for us to get together as the global community working on COVID neuro to better understand the presentations, complications, long-term effects and disease mechanisms of neurological COVID disease. It's also a chance to keep up to date with the latest research. And then immediately following this one hour webinar, we have the WHO Clinical Exchange Network where we talk about individual cases from different regions around the world. Today's uh, COVID webinar is a presentation from, first of all, from Lucia Brito. There she is, give us a wave, Lucia, good to see you. And uh, she'll be talking about mechanisms of brain disease in uh, COVID uh, in Brazil. And then after that, we've got uh, a short interval, which is Emma, who is one of our JNNP blogging team, who will be presenting the latest research findings as posted in the JNNP blog. And then we've got Ben Michael, a colleague of mine here from the University of Liverpool. Give us a wave, Ben. Uh, who's going to be presenting this large study uh, of COVID-19 in the UK. And then, as I said, uh, we, we want you guys to interact uh, via the uh, chat function. In fact, what we usually do is ask everybody just to post now on the chat function and, uh, and say hello and tell us where you're from and whether this is your first webinar. So if people would like to chat now, and that will help me know whether it's working. Uh, ben, do you want to type away and tell me where you're from and then I'll know it's working? Nothing's come up yet. Oh, there we are, they're coming up. Great, thank you very much. Um, so uh, please do send in your comments, uh, questions via the chat function. We have time for questions after each of the talks. Um, and then also, as I mentioned, let me see if I can go back one slide. Uh, yes, uh, as I mentioned, after an hour, we'll be having this uh, WHO COVID Neuro Clinical Exchange, which today is coming from Zambia. Okay, so um, I will stop sharing now and I will ask Lucia to share her screen. And we will, there we go. So Lucia, if you'd like to share your screen and then we can hear all about what's been happening in Brazil. And as I've said to people, please post your questions into the chat function and we'll feed those to Lucia uh, after her talk. Well, thank you, Tom. I have a pleasure to share with this audience two challenging cases uh, that present with neurological manifestation with temporal relationship to some viruses, including SARS-CoV. This is my conflict. And uh, initially, I will print off uh, this background just to discuss the clinical cases, the mechanism of uh, viral invasion, pathway of neurological com com commitment, uh, pathogens of uh, the neurological damage, and also some disease associated with uh, SARS-CoV infection. And the pathway that we, uh, the literature identify is a transsynaptic transfer by infected neurons also infection by the olfactory nerve 
infection by vascular endothelium related to some uh, kind, sorts of disorders in uh, in manifestation, neurological manifestation, and leukocyte migration through the blood brain barrier. And uh, we know that the pathogenesis uh, they try to explain by direct direct inf infection damage, hypoxic damage. Uh, involve AC involving that are present in uh, any systems such as uh, brain and also immunological damage. And they result in a central nervous system uh, disorders and also peripheral nervous system disorders. And uh, in the paper that Padovani and col collaborators, they try to analyze some uh, neurological disorders related to SARS-CoV, uh, considering the pathogenesis of pulmonary systemic disease with uh, hyperinflammation, multi-organ failure, and uh, hypercoagulative state, resulting in some uh, uh, neurological diseases, such as encephalitis, encephalopathy, and stroke. But there is another explanation, pathogenic explanation as a direct invasion of the nervous system with the vasculitis and also stroke, encephalitis and peripheral uh, compromise, uh, neurological peripheral compromise, and also cause infection immunomediated complications, such as again, encephalitis, Guillain-Barré syndrome and variants, uh, acute necrotizing encephalitis and ADEM. There is some uh, uh, symptoms uh, that we could uh, explain some situation uh, of a compromise of the system, ne central nervous system disease, disease as impaired consciousness, confusion, cortical tract signs, and uh, many other uh, symptoms. And uh, just from this point, we try to analyze the cases that you saw in, a, in a, our hospital uh, in the northeast of Brazil. And then we try to find the, this infection in a previous uh, disorders as a presence of immune-mediated diseases such as MS, myasthenia gravis, uh, neuromyelitis optic disorders, and myelitis and others. And uh, I try to identify a complication of SARS-CoV in absence of immunomediated disease as uh, vascular manifestation and other manifestation. From this point, we try to identify two cases that we could uh, discuss uh, from this, this point. The first case is a, a female with a 41 year old when she first saw last year and uh, near, she is from nearby Recife and uh, she presented during the period of 2016. She presented with the clinical picture that was diagnosed as chikungunya, such as uh, myalgia, arthralgia, fever and uh, edema. And uh, after four months, she presented with a reduced right side visual equity with the total recovery in maybe in 15 days, two weeks. And uh, she became free of symptoms during uh, some period. And uh, in 2019, she presented with the trunk uh, herpes zoster. And the beginning of May, she present with uh, man neurological manifestations such as a uh, left lower limb numbness. That was, she recovered well during this time. And uh, in December of the same year, she present with the deficit motor grade four in lower limb, the same lower, lower limb, and uh, maybe some uh, focal cries, a tremor on the right side of face. It was in December. And uh, when she went to the first consultation in February 2020, and uh, she presented mild uh, cognitive uh, complications, 
and uh, and with the history of uh, hypothyroidism, uh, recurrent lip herpes simplex virus and recurrent uh, herpes zoster virus, and a family history of uh, leukemia. Uh, after this first, first consultation, we demand uh, some uh, compl complementary exams, try to find out what are happening with her and uh, try to finalize the diagnosis. And uh, the, the pandemic starts in, in March and then she do not return to the consultation with uh, the, the exams. And in July, 2020, she presents with the uh, flu-like symptoms, cough, uh, anosmia, agesia, and uh, without fever and diarrhea. And uh, four days after, the nasopharyngeal swab was uh, detectable SARS-CoV-2. And uh, in July, she presents again a bilateral low limb numbness. Uh, she recovered it from this episode. And in September, she presented again, I have exhausted on left side of the trunk and returned to the second consultation with the scars in the local and thorax uh, uh, in the trunk left side where happens the episode and no normal neurological examination at that time. And she bring with her the, the exam that I ordered in uh, March. And uh, from that time, she presented cerebral spinal fluid with the mild increase in cells. And uh, the other biomarker was normal. And the magnetic resonance image that uh, we, that she bring brain MRI and thoracic, uh, cervical and thoracic spinal cord. And again, she did another brain MRI after uh, Saskov because of her, of her complaints. And she present with uh, this uh, MRI that she first bring to me in February when he did, she did the first consultation. And that shows the hyper intense uh, a signal in uh, both temporal lobes and uh, also in hippocampus and uh, some other areas of uh, may, maybe some inflammation, some sort of inflammation. And uh, in, in March, she performed again the other MRI. And uh, <clears throat> again, she present with the, the slightly recover from the, the lesion of in the temporal lobe, left temporal lobe, but still present the, the other uh, inflammation. And after SARS-CoV, she did again the, the MRI that present another, a new lesion on the fo posterior fossa. And also some uh, other uh, hyper intense lesions. And again, another view of the, the MRI in the three times that she did. And uh, during this uh, MRI that she did in, uh, in August, she present new lesions, as I said before, in corpus callosum and posterior fossa, subcortical uh, area and white matter area, and also a uh, lesion in cervical cord and maybe one in thoracic spinal cord. And uh, from this point, we think that uh, she presents initially uh, op an optic neuritis. And uh, despite she do not present a stronger uh, symptoms that you could think in a, an encephal herpes encephalite. She presents the lesions compatible with the, an encephalite, uh, maybe herpes encephalites. And uh, after SARS-CoV, she presents with the multiple sclerosis-like syndrome that uh, the basis is a damage in a, in a caused by immune system.
And we know that the viruses uh, recruit and activate some uh, cells that uh, initiate the cascade, the immunological cascade, and uh, activate the innate and adaptive immune response. And uh, but we know that uh, the damage is caused by some uh, some uh, depending on viral invasion strategies interference of antigen processing and presentation, maybe load of uh, infection and host uh, as genetic susceptibility. And uh, trying to find the explanation for the three uh, trigger for the, the disorders of that this patient present, we try to, to find out some uh, uh, papers in the literature that uh, talk about uh, host genetic susceptibility that explain the invasion of proteins, DNA, and RNA that was recognized by the PRR receptors and uh, induced the synthesis of tau like receptors that are responsible for the activation of uh, interferon regulatory factors and the uh, synthesis of uh, interferon uh, alpha and beta, and uh, also a synthesis of inflammatory cytokines. And uh, maybe it could be represented by polymorphism or deficiency, increasing the permeability and allowance to the virus entering in the ce cerebral nervous system, uh, central nervous system, and also uh, increase the risk of infection. Uh, and uh, we consider as post chic optic neuritis, post uh, zoster encephalitis, and also uh, post SARS CoV uh, multiple sclerosis like syndrome that, uh, that implicate in a me in me immunological mechanism such as response failure and increased uh, susceptibility. In the second case, we have a patient with 42 year old from Recife. She was attended in January this year in the emergency department with uh, complaints of uh, impaired consciousness, probable seizure because she presented with conjugating loop deviation and disoriented and reduced visual acuity. And uh, she do not uh, have his past history of hypertension, but when she was seen, she presented with the hypertension. Uh, cardiac rate is uh, a little bit uh, moderate, and the respiratory rate is normal, quite normal. Uh, uh, oxygen saturation normal, but she presented with mild uh, febrile. And uh, the complementary exams of this patient present with chest CT with bilateral ground glass opacity. Uh, nasopharyngeal swab was also SARS-CoV-2 detectable. And we perform then the head computerized tomography, brain MRI, and magnetic resonance angiography to trying to clarify what uh, we think about this patient. The cerebral spinal fluid that was the uh, two days after her admission. Uh, she presented with normal cells, protein elevated and glucose elevated, showing that she was initially, uh, she has a, a past history of uh, uh, diabetes mellitus. And uh, the, the dimmer is uh, elevated and also the leukometry. And the first, uh, uh, head tomography shows this hypodensity in the posterior region of the brain. And uh, this is a control some days, uh, five days after the, the first one. Sorry, uh, 80 days after the first one. And shows um, that it's uh, our head reduced of this high hyperdensity and uh, is it what we see from one time to another and the brain MRI show the same uh, aspects and uh, 
we realized that there is some compromise uh, through the, the uh, another uh, areas, not only uh, brain uh, a posterior region. And the, the is the same uh, picture and uh, the angiography, cervical and brain angiography was normal. And we did diagnose this patient with the, having a posterior reversible encephalopathy syndrome in express that was first described in 1996. And uh, she present, uh, this patient present with surgery that is very important uh, manifestation in this situation impaired consciousness and also a visual symptom such as our patient. And we could emphasize that uh, the predominance is in female and a middle-aged, but we can see uh, in younger and older patients. Uh, the pathogenic mechanism maybe include uh, cerebral vasogenic edema with the uh, neuronal components and vascular components, uh, with uh, endothelium secreting vasodilators and, and then uh, vasoconstrictor in this mechanism, and the increasing concentration of circulating cytokines that interact and uh, predispose to a disruption of type junction and breakdown of, of the blood brain barrier with cytokine release to the tissue, brain tissue, and the astrocyte injury, and also an interstitial edema. And there is a lot of uh, condition that should uh, be uh, considered as differential diagnosis, and uh, I don't have time to describe any one of that, but there is a lot of uh, possibilities that we have to think when we face this sort of condition, but we have to consider in this case, the presence of uh, the positivity of SARS-CoV-2. Uh, and we have to consider also the interleukin inhibitors in this situation. And also uh, the, we have to have in mind that uh, we could uh, uh, find ischemic and hemorrhagic events associated with press and uh, the case to be complicated if we identify some, some sort of uh, degree of hemorrhage. I'm sorry. And uh, uh, summarizing these two cases, and uh, we know that neurological diseases related to SARS-CoV infection uh, shows a, a wide spectrum, as you saw in the in many papers, such as uh, Padovani paper, and the and the what we identify in our everyday life uh, in the in the hospitals, and the pathway involving vascular endothelial and leukocyte migration through through the blood brain barrier is, is present in these two cases. And immunologic response failure, maybe in two cases also, and susceptibility of host and immune system, uh, mainly in the first one case. And the mechanisms are, of the viral invasion are different, but in some points they are common, such as a cytokine storm that could explain the first case and also the second case that we present now. And uh, uh, I have, uh, I think I have time to ask some question if, if possible, and I would like to thank uh, the whole team of Global Health. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Lucia. Thank you very much. Um, yes, indeed, we do have a, a, a time for a couple of quick questions. Um, if people would like to ask them, just post them into the chat function. Um, I can see a question here from Ben Michael. Uh, did you find a TLR mutation in the first patient and do we know viral load or CT uh, to point towards a mutation in the interferon pathways? We are trying to stimulate uh, the, the, to get some blood sample to stimulate uh, with the 
uh, cells and hype trying to identify which sort of cytokines and chemokines they produce after some sort of simulation but we have don't we don't have time yet to do this we we organize this thing things for maybe may april when we have uh, time uh, people and uh, staff from the lab and also the the kids to do this sort of uh, of ex ex exploration thank you um, there's a comment here from Pedro uh, Miguel uh, in, it doesn't say where he's um, messaging from, but he says he had a patient with advanced HIV in whom hand was suspected prior to the pandemic. The patient acquired coronavirus and showed up with severe neurological deterioration. How to differentiate the effects on neurological function elicited by each virus, do you think? Yeah, we have some patient with uh, uh, HIV infected and mm -hmm. some new symptoms. And one of them we identify as having SARS-CoV uh, detectable. And she present with, uh, uh, he present with uh, a peripheral uh, nervous system uh, problem that we, we identify as a Guillain-Barre syndrome. And we treat them as uh, as we treat the, the other Guillain-Barre patients, and uh, he recovered. But uh, we know that uh, is more less responsive than we saw in a, in our everyday with life with the other cases of uh, Guillain-Barre. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, I think your, your cases illustrate the, the, you know, the wide range of, of, of neurological manifestations or associations of, of infection with this virus. And of course, there are now studies coming through on a range of genetic risk factors, um, less so for neurological disease, but, but certainly for severe SARS-CoV-2 infection. And I guess as time goes on, we will, we will begin to get uh, genetic handles on the neurological presentations, do you think? I think we have to study these cases uh, properly with the genetical background, trying to emphasize HLA, trying to say if there is uh, some sort of HLAG protected or non protected patients, and also the susceptibility to develop some sort of, uh, as you saw, when the patient do not induce the toll like receptors properly she present with some sort of uh, infections. Absolutely, absolutely. Okay, thanks. Well, we better pause there. So we're gonna move on now. Emma Rengasamy, if you want to turn your camera on and share your screen. Uh, there she is, hi, Emma. She's uh, going to give us the latest update from uh, the JNNP. I think I'm being asked to share your slides. Is that right, Emma? Do you want me SP, to- Thank you slides? very much. Okay, I will do my best. Emma, do you want to tell us about yourself whilst they're opening up? You're uh, uh, a junior doctor, I think, somewhere. Just introduce yourself whilst I pull your slides up. Yes, thank you very much. So um, I'm a junior doctor currently based near Cardiff. And um, yeah, I'm presenting today on behalf of the team. Perfect. You thank you very much. Do you want to swap displays or not? Um, no, that, that's fine. Good. OK. OK, um, carry on. Thank you very much. Um, so good afternoon, everyone. Um, I've been set the exciting challenge of uh, summarizing four papers today um, that we have seen um, whilst curating on our blog. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll get started. Thank you very much. So the first paper we want to really talk about is that we already know there's been a lot of neurological and neuropsychiatric manifestations of COVID-19. And we're seeing a lot of big data to support this. And this huge study um, was really interesting. Lee et al have looked at over 35,000, so specifically 35,177 um, patients infected with COVID, both children and adults, um, and spanning 348 different hospitals and over six different countries. So one of their key findings was, was that in patients with more severe COVID symptoms, what they found were these increased 
relative risks of myopathy, encephalitis, um, and disorders of consciousness as well, which we um, think is likely delirium. Um, so very interesting study. One of their limitations obviously was that the severe cases that, that they um, talked about were varied across different sites. Um, so yeah, so I think this, this study represents increase in CNS and PNS symptoms in COVID in patients. And the next paper, it's the next paper is our, our very own, oh, sorry, slightly um, in different order. So this next paper by Agarwal and, and colleagues is a retrospective multi-center study um, looking in tertiary care, care centers. And what they looked at specifically was um, brain alteration. So they compared um, two MRIs between um, these patients. And it's quite a small sample of 21 patients. Um, but what they found were they saw white matter changes, like the volume changes, and changes in ventricular size. So these findings do show some possible brain alterations um, and potentially so some interesting findings here about the imaging um, in COVID-19. It would be interesting to see the baseline imaging and to see you know, these patients in, in long term and how, how they follow up. Okay, thank you. And um, this next paper here was very interesting because it looks quite long term. And it looks at outcomes, not just the acute outcomes, but it looks at um, quite later on as well. So in this, this um, specific paper, it looked at um, a number of different survivors, so 228 survivors, and they looked at their their symptoms one month after discharge and three months after discharge. And these were majority hospital inpatients. A small number were discharged home. And what they found was persistent depressive symptoms at the three months follow-up. Um, but what they found interestingly was a decrease in PTSD and insomnia symptoms at this follow-up. So it shows some interesting trends here. And they link this to the inflammation and the systemic inflammation, how this could be linked to depression. And I think on a on a you know wider level, it shows that maybe it signals a different approach to treatment and it adds another layer of data looking at the long-term impact of COVID. And it'll be interesting again to see um see what happens to these patients at six months and at and at um, nine months to see you know how how they do recover. Thank you. And um, this final paper is our, our own meta-analysis. Um, so our own meta-analysis, which we did internationally, looking at a number of different studies, again, looking at acute um, complications of COVID-19, neuropsychiatric and neurological. And in our study, we included about 215 studies comprising of a number of different patients. And what we looked at specifically was the point prevalence of some common, um, common symptoms and conditions that, that we, were, we were finding. And you, as you can see, this was weakness, anosmia, dysphusia, weakness, and fatigue. And what we were finding was actually, there were not many studies actually looking at very specific neuro, neuropsychiatric conditions like anxiety, depression, and sleep disorders. So it'll be interesting to see, you know, that we are doing ongoing further work on this and interesting to see where this goes and we're currently working on a living meta-analysis at the moment um yeah and this leads me very nicely to our final slide we thank you very much for listening but also um we are ongoing doing lots of work with this so if you if you would like to join our team please get in touch with us at the email address or please find us on twitter and um yeah we'd, we'd love to discuss more with you thank you Thank you. Thanks very much, Emma. That was um, superb, as always, a very speedy run through a lot of really interesting papers. Um, we're going to move on now to Ben Michael, um, but we may have time at the end for general discussion, including some of those papers that you've mentioned, Emma. So please, everyone, stick around. Um, ben is a, a, a colleague here at the University of Liverpool, where he's a senior clinical lecturer and a senior clinician scientist fellow. And he's going to present this UK wide cross sectional surveillance study of uh, COVID neurology and psychiatric complications. Thanks, Ben. Great, thanks, and thanks for the invite. You know, as has been illustrated by uh, Lucia's presentation, there's multiple potential pathophysiology driving the disease mechanisms of the effects of SARS-CoV-2 on the brain, whether it's cytokine storms or at CNS autoantibodies or a vasculopathy, or perhaps even often uh, potentially direct viral invasion of the brain, um, but really to get at these underlying disease mechanisms, the first thing we have to do is understand the spectrum of the clinical phenotypes, who is at risk, 
and who's at risk particularly of a poor outcome. And that's really why we set up the coroner studies in, U in the UK, which is a collaborative effort between basically all of the UK's uh, professional neuroscience bodies, including the Association of British Neurologists and the Royal College of Psychiatrists. And we set up a rapid reporting platform where busy clinicians could notify us of cases that they were seeing. Um, our first publication uh, came out in, in June last year. Um, and uh, the main findings from that were that working together, actually, we were able to get up and recruit patients to the study during the exponential phase of the pandemic. And when we looked at these patients, about half of them had had strokes or other cerebrovascular events, and about a third had had a neuropsychiatric presentation. And really the take home message from this early surveillance study of 153 patients was that whilst uh, neuropsychiatric presentations did occur at all ages, when we compare them relative to the cerebrovascular cases, they skewed to this younger population with about half of patients with neuropsychiatric presentations being under 60 and about a quarter being in their 20s, 30s and 40s. We've gone on now and we've got notifications from uh, coming close to 800 patients uh, from, from the pandemic, but we've taken a look at the first 511 from the uh, first wave of the pandemic. And when we look at light grey uh, here, which is the hospitalizations of, of any COVID patient during our first wave in the UK, you can see this sharp exponential rise and then the tail of hospital admissions. But then when you compare that to the proportion of neurological and psychiatric cases which were being reported through our national surveillance portals, Early in the pandemic, the vast majority of cases we were being notified of were cerebrovascular events. And those cases seemed to decline as the first uh, peak of, of hospital admissions declined. And really interestingly, conversely, there was a, a, a rise in the number of cases of, of alterations in mental status here in the, the dot and dash line. But what we don't know, of course, is whether this reflects a difference in the pathophysiology or actually a difference in reporting behavior because of awareness. Perhaps early on in the pandemic, stroke physicians were very aware of the risk of stroke with COVID. And perhaps later on in the pandemic, it became increasingly apparent that these alterations in mental status uh, were more common. So we, we don't know. Uh, so clearly what we wanted to do was really dig into the data. And it's this paper, which is currently under consideration and is available as a preprint on SSRN, where we really looked uh, in detail uh, why, with not just notification level data, but with a detailed clinical case record form. So we had uh, complete data on 267 cases. Uh, a third were female and 18% were from black, Asian or minority ethnic groups uh, with 42% being below the age of 60 uh, and the diagnosis of COVID-19 uh, met the WHO criteria for confirmed or probable in 90% of cases. And they had the, the typical symptoms you'd expect of uh, like cough, fever and lethargy. This is how the cases broke down first anatomically and then by pathophysiology. So the majority of cases actually were a central manifestation of disease rather than peripheral. Again, predominantly cerebrovascular events, but uh, then these inflammatory, delirious and psychiatric presentations, uh, which we'll go into in a bit more detail. When we look at the timing from symptom onset from a respiratory standpoint to then the onset of the neurological or psychiatric syndrome, a really clear pattern arises. Cerebrovascular events, tended to present roughly at or around the same time as the respiratory symptoms. Whereas conversely, the central inflammatory disorders, psychiatric disorders and peripheral neuropathies tended to present later with a median of between uh, 10 to 20 days from the onset of respiratory symptoms, uh, suggesting there might be a different, genuinely a different pathophysiology uh, that's driving this. Perhaps in the cerebrovascular cases, it's a direct viral infection of the endothelium or a para-infectious cytokine response, whereas central inflammatory and psychiatric manifestations may rather be a post-infectious uh, antibody-mediated syndrome. And a couple of other key points came out of this uh, analysis of the chronology was that actually 66 of our patients presented with their neurology after they'd recovered from their respiratory disease, and 69 patients actually presented with their neurological syndrome prior to at having any, any respiratory symptoms, uh, which really highlights the importance of documents like this WHO checklist, which has been produced by Kieran Thacker and Kameshwar Prasad, uh, and we've, we've been helping with it, but they've been taking the lead, um, which outlines uh, when we ought to be thinking about COVID when our neurology patients come to us. 
because they may not have much in the way of respiratory symptoms. When we looked at the cohort overall, um, the cerebrovascular events broke down into those that are ischemic, hemorrhagic, and also cerebral venous sinus thrombosis. Um, and we'll go into the inflammatory and others uh, in more detail, uh, but only just to highlight here that of the psychiatric uh, presentations in 25 patients, whilst six were exacerbations of a known previous psychiatric condition, actually 19 were de novo uh, psychiatric diagnoses, including psychosis, uh, catatonia, uh, and depression. But beyond the primary diagnosis, if one looks at the patient in the round, there were actually many patients that had overlapping syndromes. So, for example, patients with a cerebrovascular event, but also CNS inflammation, patients with CNS inflammation who had a psychiatric manifestation, uh, and this combination of central and peripheral disorders. And uh, what was critical was that in this group of patients who had these overlapping syndromes, um, they were more likely to require intensive care with 65% requiring intensive care, and they were more likely to require mechanical ventilation, that being the case in 71%. So these overlapping syndromes are interesting uh, and perhaps uh, reflect our patients that are most severely affected. Now, there's a lot to talk about in this quite large study, um, but I'm going to focus on uh, the severe encephalopathy group and the cerebrovascular group uh, because they were severe uh, cases where there's lots of work to be done. In terms of these cases of severe encephalopathy, they actually uh, wouldn't meet the 10 societies delirium criteria because they had severely reduced levels of arousal. They fell into three categories, either patients who had a, a coma, often with cardiac and renal complications, or patients presenting with seizures that were either young or older. The older patients tended to be those with existing neurological diagnoses like frontotemporal dementia or Alzheimer's disease where COVID had induced a seizure. But there was this group of younger patients who presented, who were previously healthy and presented with seizures or status epilepticus in the absence of pre-morbid conditions. And these younger patients often had higher uh, in-hospital resource utilization, again with prolonged periods of duration of ventilation and increased likelihood of requiring intensive care. Now, when we look in these patients that didn't have MRI scans, clearly it's hard to determine or, uh, often what the cause of the severe encephalopathy is. But in a similar number of patients, we had a leukoencephalopathy uh, when the MRI scan was performed, uh, as we can see here on the, uh, the coronal T2 flare. Or we also had uh, five cases of uh, four cases, sorry, of uh, posterior reversible encephalopathy syndrome, uh, similar to that uh, presented by uh, Lucia. And this uh, reinforces that that's been found by other groups, including the Huang paper and the NCOVID group. And of course, there are huge clinical challenges to performing MRI scans on patients who got COVID because of infection control risks, but also just because of the uh, pressures on the healthcare system due to the pandemic. But with this large group of severe encephalopathies, really there's definitely a, a role for MRI because we know that when we do do an MRI, often these patients have a leukoencephalopathy or PRES uh, or uh, an encephal encephalitis-like MRI picture. With regards to the strokes then, the most common group, 27% um, uh, were actually aged under 60. And what was really interesting was when you compared those under 60 to those over 60, uh, there was a delayed presentation with the younger patients tending to present on average 10 days after their respiratory symptoms, whereas the older patients uh, typically presented at or around the time of COVID symptoms. The older patients tend to have more comorbidities like hypertension and diabetes, but actually even in the younger group, 67% uh, had some sort of cardiovascular comorbidity. The younger group tended to have uh, multi-vessel infarction. Uh, so uh, the cases like uh, this one with it, uh, a, a dissection and a large infarction, but also multi-lobar uh, strokes as demonstrated here uh, and bihemispheric lacuna infarcts. And they often had uh, non-CNS uh, thrombosis also. But of course, comparing COVID stroke just by age is uh, not necessarily as useful as comparing them to a, a non-COVID uh, stroke cohort. So uh, here in gray are, are the data from our national uh, uh, audit of non-COVID stroke in the same time window, but in 2019, 
So if you compare those in gray to our COVID stroke patients in red, you can see here COVID stroke patients were actually twice as likely to uh, be under the age of 60. But despite this, they often had risk factors such as heart failure, hypertension, diabetes, cerebrovascular disease or atrial fibrillation. And also in compared to the non-COVID cohort, they were more likely to have non-CNS thrombosis, either pulmonary, cardiac or renal. Regardless of the diagnostic variable, however, the strongest predictor of a poor outcome was age with an odds ratio of 1.66 and the uh, pre-COVID uh, uh, clinical frailty score uh, with an odds ratio of uh, 1.48. When we compare the Nadir MRS, so how bad the patient is at their worst in hospital to their likelihood of a favorable outcome, you can see that uh, most of the inflammatory, delirious and psychiatric patients actually tended to make some improvement uh, by the time they're discharged from hospital. Whereas actually, unfortunately for the cerebrovascular cases, actually many of them had a, a poor outcome uh, proportionate to their Nadir uh, modified ranking score. So our work and the work of others has demonstrated these severe acute neurological complications are common, often occur in those that are previously healthy also. But clearly the mechanisms driving the, this is unresolved and the clinical biomarkers remain undefined. And clearly we must uh, understand these mechanisms if we're going to direct clinical practice and prevent brain injury, which as we know is associated with lifelong disability. And that's why I'm delighted that the COVID clinical neuroscience study has been funded, COVID CNS, uh, of which I'm co-PI with Jerome Breen at King's, um, in which we're gonna go beyond characterizing the clinical phenotypes that we've explored through the coroner studies, but really drill down within these phenotypes to the specific mechanisms driving these neurological complications really determining who's at risk and the medium term sequelae. We intend to establish the role for routine uh, biomarkers, serum and CSF biomarkers, but identify the underlying pathogenesis uh, using virologic and immunolog immunologic techniques, and determine the role of biomarkers of CNS injury, both in serum and on structural and functional MRI, and determine if similar but milder complications exist in community cases. And back to the genetic points raised by uh, Lucia's cases, our overarching hypothesis is that if we combine markers of CNS inflammation, brain injury, and genetic risk, we can identify mechanisms of these acute complications, uh, acute complications and their sequelae, so that we can mechanistically stratify patients, not just phenotypically, but also by mechanism to direct them towards targeted uh, therapy with either existing or novel therapeutic options. And it just brings me to draw to a close the conclusion that clearly, COVID-19 is associated with a broad spectrum of neurological manifestations throughout the central and peripheral nervous system. Outcomes vary between uh, disease groups and pre-COVID status. There is a group with severe encephalopathy. There's also a group with large and multi-vessel stroke who are often young and often who have thrombosis outside of the central nervous system, which requires further study. But despite this, conventional modifiable risk factors are often present. And if this is confirmed in other studies, there's clearly a huge potential public health intervention impact there. And finally, if we bring clinical data together with biomarkers and neuroimaging, we really can potentially stratify patients to targeted therapeutics. And whilst there remain many unanswered questions working together across the neurosciences and also across the globe, uh, we might finally answer them. Just to say thank you to the COVID CNS team uh, here in the UK. Uh, thanks to the postdocs, PhD fellows and other fellows that do a lot of the background work uh, to the uh, uh, neuroscience education team here, uh, and of course to the coroner studies group, uh, uh, particularly those pictured here, and Tom and Laura who co-chair our steering committee. And uh, thank you all for, for the time. Thank you very much, Ben, that was lovely. Um, so we have time for uh, questions or comments. If anyone wants to uh, post any, uh, you could probably stop sharing your screen now, Ben, if you, if you want. There we go, great. Um, and uh, Lucia, you could join again if you if you want to, turn your camera on, because some of these are, are, are rather more general questions, I think. Um, first of all, a question for Ben from uh, Eric Schmutzard. Hi, Eric, good, good to see you. Um, how many of the stroke patients, the COVID stroke patients, had a cardiogenic type of stroke? I.e., how often do we have a myocarditis, cardiac arrhythmia, or a coronary artery disease exacerbated by COVID and causing the stroke, do you think? Yeah, that's a great question, Eric, thanks. Um, 
it's a slightly false dichotomy to break patients down as under 60 or over 60, but the data, at least from this study, looks like if you take the 131 patients, those over 60 were more likely to have their stroke at or around the time of COVID, suggesting that COVID has pushed them into atrial fibrillation or that, that it's dislodged a, 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 an existing atheroma, uh, whereas in those patients that were younger, it tended to be delayed, um, and we think that's an endotheliopathy um, in, in many of these younger patients. But the interaction between conventional risk factors and, and SARS-CoV-2 is exactly what we're looking at in COVID-CNS. Thanks. And um, a question from uh, Alka. Uh, any data so far uh, that scientists know of through any study undertaken or ongoing regarding the prior medical history correlation that could predispose to neurological associations or manifestations to any degree. You, you touched on that a little bit, I think. What do we know about prior disease and how that puts it at risk of, of uh, future disease? And uh, Lucia, if you're there, if you want to switch on as well, because it'd be good to get your thoughts on some of these questions. Ben. Thanks. I see. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, let Lucia go. Yeah. Turn your camera on, Lucia, and then we can see you as well, and then we know you're ready. I think I have a problem with my video. Oh, okay. okay. All right. Do you want to answer that, that question anyway? Uh, and then Ben could come in. But what's your feeling about uh, risks of neurological disease based on past medical history? What, what things in the past put, put people at risk? Clearly, the, one of the patients you presented today was at risk in the sense that they had immunosuppression. But do you have any broader thoughts on this? Yes, we are facing some uh, uh, huge number of patients with uh, uh, many different uh, immunological uh, problems, neurological problems. But uh, the, when they get uh, SARS-CoV-2, they are not so complicated as we saw in other patients. Maybe the the medication that they are exposed to, maybe some protection or some other things that we don't have the explanation yet. But. Thanks, and, and Ben, what about from, from the data, from the UK data? Yeah, so the, the first thing I would say is that I, I do think that Lucia's first patient is, is unusual to have recurrent herpetic infection like that. So, you know, it's high likelihood there is a, a toll-like receptor mutation or somewhere along the interferon jacks that pathway. Um, so, so what we were all worried about, of course, was that the pre-existing conditions of having something neurological and being on immunosuppressive therapy for MS, for example, would put you at risk of severe disease. And actually, mercifully, that's not been the case thus far, There's certainly not large signal coming through. But from the data, I, I think that we are seeing is that for each conventional cardiovascular risk factor, it proportionally increases your risk of having a cerebrovascular event at the time of having COVID. Now, if this is replicated in other studies and across other settings, I mean, th isn't there a public health intervention there? You know, controlling hypertension, controlling diabetes, all these modifiable risk factors, which we're well aware of and we have good treatments for, may represent uh, a, a population level uh, improvement in pre-COVID health and therefore a proportionate reduction in COVID-related complications. Mm. There was some, I don't know if you remember, there was some suggestion early on that um, patients, you know, so, so clearly when, when the pandemic started, everyone was worried about people with pre-existing respiratory disease. And then there was some suggestion that pa asthmatic patients who inhale steroids may, we, we saw less uh, severe disease in asthmatics than we might have expected. And, you know, once the dex uh, dexamethasone data came out through the recovery trial, then, then the thinking was, well, maybe the asthmatics are being protected by their inhaled steroids. Do you, have you seen anything to suggest that um, patients who are on neurological patients who are on long-term steroids or immunosuppressants might be protected in a similar way? Potentially. I, th I think what we have seen some suggestion of is that the prolonged period of post-ITU encephalopathy which was very, very common in the first wave when dexamethasone wasn't routinely given, mm. seems to be markedly reduced. Now, at least in the UK, the dexamethasone is given to those with the most severe respiratory disease. And of course, those are more likely than ITU and, I, and, and HDU. Um, so uh, it may well be that actually it's the use of dexamethasone, which is being given to treat the pulmonary disease, is actually having the beneficial effect of, of reducing the encephalopathy also. Mm. 
And ha have you heard of any, any of the brain fog patients who've had a whiff of steroids and have miraculously felt better? I feel that brain fog is mechanistically heterogeneous and probably not <laughs> a helpful diagnostic, <laughs> singular diagnostic group. <laughs> Very diplomatic. Um, let's see, we have a couple more comments here. Um, actually, there was one about uh, treatments, any specific treatments for these patients as opposed to others. Uh, this came from Zelalem Bitsu. What are the neurological measures uh, in terms of treating acute or critical patients to control the disease? Anything we should be doing differently, do you think, either of you? Lucia, would you like to answer? Yes, I think uh, the strategy for treatment this uh, patient, it's not so different when we face some other causes of uh, neurological disorders. For example, if you have some sort of demyelination after infection, we try to include uh, uh, the uh, methylprednisolone and uh, if do not respond, we start with the uh, immunoglobulin and uh, try to modify the, the course of, uh, of the disorder and the compromise of the brain. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I agree. Um, the only um, slight difference I think with COVID is um, many of us are, are, are cautious about when we use IVIG uh, because of its pro-thrombotic uh, potential. Yeah, yeah. Uh, exactly. I agree. Yeah, yeah. And, we, and it's just, I think the biggest thing actually, as Lucia says, is the treatment isn't necessarily different for GBS or for ADEM or for stroke. It's not necessarily different when it's COVID related in terms of what we can do right now. Um, but I think what we can do is recognise the spectrum of pathology and, and, and consider these co complications early. Um, certainly, you know, there's been a lot of patients with young cerebrovascular events including venous sinus thrombosis um which which sometimes can present late because it's it's not necessarily recognized that the headache uh, syndrome is severe but if there are features of raised intracranial pressure in the history or on the examination and there's an antecedent uh, history of, of covid symptoms um i think particularly cerebral venous sinus thrombosis uh, needs to be needs to be high on our differential because of the very uh, poor outcome if not treated early great we're getting a bit tight on time, but I'm, Kiran Thacker is going to switch on and she's got a good question and a good point that she's going to raise. And uh, there she is. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, no, great talk, uh, Ben and um, Maria Lucia. Thanks so much for sharing your data and knowledge. I just wanted to get your thoughts on um, some of the larger data sets that are emerging that are refuting this kind of correlation with COVID-19 and stroke and whether you think it's really something about COVID-19 or rather what we see with other serious systemic infections in the context of all the risk factors that are associated with cerebrovascular accidents. So, you know, hypercoagulability and risk of endocarditis, et cetera. So uh, how, how are you teasing that apart? Yeah, no, I, I, think, I think you're right. Um, there are there is clearly some patients who are having a stroke and it's nothing specific to SARS-CoV-2. It could have been influenza, it could have been another coronavirus. It is just what happens in people with pre-existing risk factors who decompensate in the context of any infection. Um, but from post-mortem studies and from multi-organ MRI studies, we do see infarction in pancreas, kidney, uh, lung, and we do, uh, in some uh, cases, identify virus in the endothelium which wouldn't be typical for influenza or other coronaviruses. So I think that, that both things are true. I don't think they're mutually exclusive ideas. Yes, and uh, I think we, we have this condition also in arbovirus with uh, inflammation and endothelium and then uh, stroke after some days or some uh, hours after starting the starting the disinfection and there is so many cases when we are facing the outbreak of uh, arbovirus here absolutely Lu lucia thanks for drawing attention to that and lucia was the first author in that paper which is in 
Lancet Neurology uh, just a little bit earlier in the year. We are going to have to stop there, but um, I wanted to thank you all for the great discussion. I should just feed in a message from David Nichols, a neurologist and friend in Birmingham, who says we all need to become Sir Michael Marmot fans if we weren't already. Check out hashtag build back fairer in terms of health inequalities and COVID. So yes, um, some very interesting uh, discussions from Michael Marmot on, on health inequalities, which I'm sure relate to neurological disease as well as other uh, presentations of COVID. Um, this uh, uh, slide is just to remind you uh, about the uh, resources available for looking at patients with suspected COVID vaccine neurological adverse events. And um, just to let you know about our next webinar, and we're changing the, um, slightly we're changing what we're doing in the sense that what we're planning to do going forwards is always focus on some recent uh, top quality publications, which we think people will really enjoy uh, listening to. And so um, we've got uh, on the 20th of April, we have Paul Harrison, who's going to be presenting this paper. Many of you will have seen it in Lancet Psychiatry on this bi-directional association between COVID-19 and psychiatric disorders. So not only do survivors of COVID seem to be at risk of psychiatric disease, but there's some data suggesting that if you had a psychiatric diagnosis already, you're at risk of developing COVID-19. And hopefully he'll be explaining why that is. And then also we've got Clarissa uh, Yasuda. Uh, this is a paper in Med Archive. We sort of, in a way, we look at Med Archive and try and predict which we think, which papers we think are going to end up in Lancet journals, Nature journals, et cetera. And, and this is a fantastic piece of work which starts off with uh, clinical neuropsychology scores then looks at imaging, then goes on and looks at histopathology in patients who've died, uh, uh, seeing lots of foci of infection and replication of the virus, and finally then looks at a neuronal stem cell model to try and understand what's going on. So do join us if you can on the 20th of April. Um, I'd like to thank all today's speakers. 